a highlight of my week singing with you guys, with our worship band. Isn't God good? Wow. Hope my contacts don't pop off my eyeballs here. Bear with me. I'll tell you what, church, my heart is full. My heart, my gas tank may be a little empty. My heart is full. Yesterday was so, so amazing. Thank you. So many volunteers showed up with our, our, our basically, I'm just going to call it missions. I mean, we were meeting people's needs, not only physically, but spiritually. And y'all, it was fantastic. The people who brought the major mobile dental unit were going on and on and on about you and your church and what is going on at this place that you have so many volunteers coming out and serving people and not expecting anything. And the way you loved on them speaks volumes. So I am a proud papa today. So <laughs> thank you. You guys are amazing. We, we were supposed to wrap that thing up around four. Oh, the need is so great. People coming from all over. I mean, needing care and dental work and all kinds of stuff. And you guys blew through that four o'clock appointment and five o'clock appointment and six o'clock appointment and seven o'clock appointment. It was like eight o'clock and y'all are still going strong. So thank you for all you. It's supposed to serve about 20 people on day like that. We had 38 visits and appointments yesterday. Of people came nonstop, back and forth. And, I mean, it was crazy. I ran into myself four times coming and going. So thank you. God was glorified. We got to pray with people. People were crying and breaking down and asking for prayer. And, and some of you may even be back this morning. I hope you're not in too much pain. But God bless you. It's so, so good to see what God is doing. And I'm just a proud papa. So uh, with that in mind, we're going to dive into Genesis chapter 3 today. And uh, God gave me kind of a left turn, I believe, in the middle of this week. I was going another direction, and it changed. And I love when he does that, but it scares me. And uh, as I was looking around, watching the news, and, you know, doing what I do, you ever get that feeling that the world's kind of spinning out of control? Thank you. Good. I was hoping you would say that. I mean, not like hoping you think it's bad, but that I wasn't the only one that felt like sometimes things are just all cattywampus and hippity-flippity, and things are going just so, like we are driving right off a cliff. You know, like the end of Thelma and Louise, so phew, just going right over the edge because there's no boundaries. People don't know what's right and wrong, and they don't know how to differentiate between a lie and truth. And, and it reminded me of this awesome story that I just got to share with you about a preacher who was selling a donkey to an old man. And I love it. There's this donkey. The preacher takes the, takes the donkey, and he sells it to this man. And he says, listen, you got to know this donkey has been trained in a very unique way being the donkey of a preacher, that stands to follow. And the only way to make this donkey go is to shout loudly, Hallelujah! And the only way to make the donkey stop is to say, Amen. Amen. And the donkey will stop. And the guy's like, that's incredible. So he gave the guy the money, and he took off. He was so pleased with his purchase, he immediately got on his animal to try out the preacher's instructions. He, got, he, was, he was curious. He sat down and said, Hallelujah! And sure enough, the noble steed began to trot off. And he began to go, and he was so pleased. He's like, this is cool. How do I make it stop? Amen. And the dog came to a complete stop. And it was amazing. And he's like, this is great. So with that, he said, hallelujah, and he rode off on his proud new noble steed. And he traveled for a long time just enjoying the view, and he got lost. He was heading up the mountains. And before long, he didn't even realize he was heading towards a cliff. But his mind was so engrossed in the ride and the beauty all around him, he didn't realize how close he was to danger. And then he remembered, uh-oh, I don't know the word to make this donkey stop. I have forgotten this. So he started yelling at the donkey, stop, halt. Um, uh, oh, it's something spiritual. It came from that preacher guy. What is uh, Bible. And the donkey only sped up. Church, it's got to be something like that. Finally, in desperation, he starts praying, Lord, please make this donkey stop. I am about to go off the end of this mountain. Help me now. In Jesus' name, amen. And the donkey stops. One foot from the edge of the cliff. Whew. Hallelujah. <laughs> <Boom>! <laughs> Thank you. You got it. Right off the edge of the cliff. And sometimes we have to laugh when we think, my goodness, where are we going as a society when we... We don't understand what's going on. Over these last two weeks, we've been studying biblical truth. And what happens when we blow through the guardrails that God has set up for us? What happens when we begin to think we know better than God? Well, I can tell you what happens. It's always a disaster. It's always, anytime we go, we got it from here. <laughs> it's, it makes me laugh because it's so insane. 
So arrogant of us. I know you created the world and all the cosmos, but mm, I think you've exhausted your limits of control. We'll take over. We know better. We're your creations. We know better. So this is what happens when we fail to recognize his truth, when we don't even stand on his truth, when we blur those lines and erase the boundaries that he's provided for our own good, we go right off the cliff. And then we look around and wonder, well, why that? Why'd you make that happen, God? <laughs> we take no personal responsibility for our own actions. Can we say that today? Because everybody else is always to blame. Have you noticed that? It's, it's incredible to me. Every year, there's a new word added to the Oxford English Dictionary. They get to pick one, one that had cultural relevance and impact. A couple years ago, in 2016, the word of the year captures this, the culture's fascination here and behavior. The word of the year was post-truth. Post-truth, meaning after the era of truth. We are now in a post-truth society. And what that is, if you're not sure, it is a mentality that elevates feelings and personal preference over truth, over facts. Doesn't matter what the truth says, it matters how you feel. How you feel about it. And I'm laughing right at myself because, man, my feelings, feelings lie. Feelings, nothing more than, right? This is, I look at this and I think there has to be some absolute truth. Surely things are not down this slippery slope this far. And then I saw this book by Dr. Abdu Murray. I've never heard of him before, but when I found out he was the director for Ravi Zacharias' ministry in North America, I said, this guy's probably pretty solid. And then, guess what his new book is? It's perfect. It's called Saving Truth, Finding Meaning and Clarity in a Post-Truth World. So I started looking through this, and I couldn't believe it. He says this. He says, look, we haven't abandoned truth totally yet. <laughs> we haven't given up. It's this. It's, we've simply made truth less important than our preferences and our desires. Thus, we are in a post-truth world, a post-truth era. I can't think of a better word that describes our culture. Because we live today in this thing where people are struggling to even recognize truth, much less live by it. You know what I'm talking about? Am I the only one that's feeling this way? Today, we see so many people who value feelings and personal preference over truth. Just go with your gut. Listen to your feelings. Just, just, just go, you know. No, there's one problem with that. Your feelings lie. Your feelings lie. Amen? Mm, that's pretty weak. You're not going to like the rest of this then. <laughs> Let me just go ahead and give you the, the, the warning. Just last week, if, you, if you're a friend of mine on Facebook, and if you're not, you need to be. Please send me a friend request. I won't bite, you know, unless there's something on your page you don't want your pastor to see. Hmm, that explains a lot. Okay, all right, all right. I posted this truth grenade. It was a quote from, uh, from John Piper in, his, in one of his great books. And he said this. He says, my feelings are not God. God is God. My feelings do not define truth. God's word defines truth. My feelings are just responses to what my mind perceives. That's it. That's all it is. But here's the problem. When that happens, many times my feelings are out of sync with the truth. So now what? He says, I pray a prayer. God, purify my perception of your truth so that it is in line with your truth. And I don't be mastered by my feelings. And that's powerful stuff. This post-truth, feelings above facts mindset, it didn't happen overnight. It didn't happen out of the blue. It went like, boom, oh, wow, 2019, things get weird. It's been happening all along. We've been fighting this. We see this all the way back. Its seeds came from the original Garden of Eden. God gave Adam and Eve this perfect freedom to enjoy this relationship, to enjoy the purpose for which they were created, fellowship. But something happened as you read the pages. As you go from Genesis 2 into chapter 3, something cataclysmic happened. Something huge, something nuclear just blew up and the world changed forever. Adam and Eve had it all, but they had one, one reservation. One thing, you could eat any tree in the garden, do anything you want, but of the tree of knowledge of good and evil, don't touch it. If you do, God said you will surely die. You would become aware of good and evil. Your eyes would be open and you would see things that you weren't meant to see. So here's the deal. You wouldn't just know good and evil, but you would now become able to determine 
good and evil according to your own perceptions. And this would separate our great, 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 great grandparents from the purpose and the perfect design that God had originally. So that's where we're going to start today. Open your Bibles to Genesis chapter 3. While you do that, let me welcome our online friends and our online campus. Great to have you with us. If you're following along digitally, I'm going to read from the CSB today, the Christian Standard Bible, a great, very literal translation, CSB, if you want to sync up with me on that. Genesis chapter 3, we're going to start in verse 1 and read several verses here. <clears throat> now the serpent was the most cunning of all the wild animals that the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, did God really say you can't eat from any tree in the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, well, we may eat the fruit from the trees in the garden. Oh, but about the fruit of the tree in the middle of the garden? Yes, God said, you must not eat it or touch it or you will die. <laughs> no, no, you won't die. Here it comes. Here it comes. Pay close. See if you can see what, what's about to happen. The serpent said to the woman, you won't die. In fact, God knows that when you eat it, your eyes will be opened and you'll be like God, knowing good and evil. Right? What could possibly be bad about that? Notice the appeal. Don't miss this, okay? Keep going. Verse 6. The woman looked, saw the tree was good for food and delightful to look at, and that it was desirable for obtaining wisdom. Who, who would want that anything less? So she took some of its fruit and ate it. She also gave some to her husband, who was with her. Don't forget that, men. Standing right there. And he ate it. Then the eyes of both of them were opened. And they were so excited, they high-fived God, and things were awesome and You, do you understand what just happened? Read on. Suddenly they knew they were naked. They weren't just suddenly naked. They'd been naked. But suddenly they knew they were naked. They had shame. So they sewed fig leaves together and made coverings for themselves. Oh, this is so heartbreaking because we had it so good. For these brief moments, however long Genesis 1 and 2 were this, in the garden, it was going so good. We had everything we had it made, but our great, 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 great grandparents blew it. And don't be too hard on them. Let's be honest. If that was us, I don't think we would fare a whole lot better with the serpent than they did. Remember, they were perfect in their creation to start with. Think about this. What happened? What went wrong? How did we fail to stay within these God-approved boundaries that he had done for our good, the things he gave us? If you look closer and you start to connect the dots... You're going to learn some incredible lessons, not about Adam and Eve, but about us, about ourselves. The serpent claimed, quote, you will not surely die if you eat that fruit, but instead you'll become like God. Sweet. That's how the fruit became desirable. Don't miss this. Look what happened here. Their purpose was to be with God, but their preferences were to be God. To be like it. Think about this. This is what he teased him. This is, this is so amazing. When, when this hit me this week, humanity's original sin does not come from desire for freedom. We had that. We had it in spades. It was incredible. Rather, the sin came from our desire for autonomy. Freedom and autonomy are not the same thing. They are not synonyms. Even if the world tells you that, autonomy actually comes from two Greek words, autos, which means self, and nomos, which means law. So to be autonomous means you are a law unto one's self. To thine own self be true. You are a law unto yourself. Now think about that. This is, this is a hidden gem, something very peculiar. Notice that Adam and Eve did not seem to be tempted by the forbidden fruit until Satan showed up and prayed on their preference for autonomy, their preference for self-rule, full autonomy, knows no boundaries. Think about that. The only boundaries are the ones you set. Do you see the danger in this yet? Okay, I'll go further. The only ones that you set, in other words, we can be what we want, say what we want, think what we want, do whatever we want in any way we want because objective truth and purpose are now gone. Does this sound familiar to anybody? Look around our world. Who are you to tell me what truth is? Who are you to define? You are so narrow-minded, you probably believe the Bible. Well, <laughs> guilty. 
Think about this. When you take the guardrails off, objective truth and purpose are gone. You have just replaced it with opinion and feeling. But guess what? What do you do when one person, and they have preferences, and they are a law unto themselves, clashes with your preferences, and you are a law unto yourself, and truth is relative now, who wins? Exactly. I'll tell you who loses. It's the truth. Truth doesn't win because you've just relegated that to the back burner. Now your personal preference, your truth, unto you, find your own truth. I don't want to find my truth. I've looked inside me, and it's frightening. Scripture says the heart of man is deceitful above all things, even a pastor. I want to know what God's truth is, what his boundaries are, what his purpose for us. This is, this is so great. I love how Dr. Murray puts it. There's a beautiful quote. He says this. He says, when we sacrifice truth as the burnt offering on the altar of our autonomy, the rising smoke will choke the very breath out of freedom's lungs. Wow. Why can't I come up with stuff like that? That's so deep, so powerful. We should just give an invitation and, and just, just be done with it. Think about this. True biblical freedom is so different because it actually has boundaries. And our pride, let's be honest, our pride does not like to be told what to do. We don't like to submit to a higher authority. None of us do. That's our sinful nature. Sadly, that's the norm now because from this moment, sinful nature is in us. It's part of our DNA, which makes it so important. We understand why Jesus came. It all goes back to him, and that's the gospel. I'm getting way ahead of myself. I want to talk to you about boundaries, because I know we got a lot of younglings in the room today, and I want to show you what I mean. When Amy and I first bought our house, it was a little starter home. We're still in it 20 years later, little tiny, little cute, and we said, one day we're going to have kids, but we'll move. Well, we didn't move. We just had lots of kids, and we said, we need a fence. Because we have a scary backyard with big trees and Bigfoot lives out there because we hear them, we see them and scary stuff. And our neighbors have dogs that must be possessed by demons because they always come running in and they were barking and yapping and leaving presents in our yard. And I said, we can't use the backyard for the purpose we had in mind. So we got a fence and everything changed. And then I looked into the research on fences. Y'all, this is going to blow your mind. This is so cool. There was a study done, an actual study about boundaries. And they looked at playgrounds and how kids reacted in these playgrounds. And the study was so shocking, there was a result that no one expected. The researchers found that on playgrounds that were fenced in, the children ran all over the entire playground. They were laughing and playing and running and feeling totally free, exploring every inch of the fenced-in play area. They were truly enjoying the purpose of the playground. But when they removed the fence, they were stunned. Because they expected, just like you probably did and I did, that they would run even freer. And they would go wild, like, woo, freedom, the fence is down, let's go. Just the opposite happened. The children began to be more timid. In fact, the study showed that instead of playing with joyful, reckless abandon, they tended to gather around the teacher and play closer, reluctant to stray from her protective view. They played with so much more, they were so much more tentative. This was so shocking. The boundary was gone. And they seemed to be less able to enjoy the purpose of the playground. Does that, that ring home with it? Just like that fence, God's word, truth, is the boundary that gives us freedom to enjoy our purpose. And we got to instill that in our children, into the next generation. We looked at it last week, John chapter 8. We talked about the truth, and we saw this verse right here. You shall know the truth, and the truth will set you free. That's a beautiful, powerful verse. Jesus, truth and freedom to him are linked. And he goes even further, later claiming to be truth that sets us free. And he says this in verse 36. So if the Son sets you free, you will be free indeed. But that is not what the world tells us. They say boundaries, especially biblical boundaries, are restrictive. And there are handcuffs. And you are a shallow bigoted, racist, sexist, homophobic, Islamophobic, your momophobic kind of hateful person if you believe truth. You should be more open-minded. Well, <laughs> have you ever heard you can be so open-minded that your brains fall out? Because God's word gives me barriers and boundaries and things that are for my good. The world falsely comes up and seductively whispers, hey, 
Your preferences are what lead to freedom. It's your preference, your personal feelings that give you that autonomy and freedom you're looking for. And Jesus says, no, it is biblical truth that leads to true freedom. I made you. I know you. I have the owner's manual. I know what's best for you. So how does this apply to us today? How, let's get practical. Let's get in the real world here and see how does having boundaries make us free? Pastor, I see the verses up there. I get it. But how does Jesus make me free? So let's break it down real, real, in the real world. How would you respond this week? You walk into work, you walk into school, and someone heard this message, and they say, tell me something. How does Jesus make us free indeed? How would you answer that question? What would you say? Well, guess what? Recently, at an open forum in a college, a little college named Yale University, they had a questioner come up, and Dr. Murray was there, and he asked that exact question. I don't have time to read 7,000 pages of his response, but I can boil it down into three simple truths. You must believe to understand what freedom in Christ is. The first thing is this. We are beings made in God's image. Period. Full stop. We were created in his likeness. Male and female he made that. We studied this last week. We were made in his image. We're not random accidents. We have purpose. We didn't just poof ourselves into existence apart from an indifferent God or some amoeba floating around and bumping into each other and slam dancing and eventually we stand upright, start shaving, and here we are. That is not what God says. The second truth, our original purpose was communion with God. We had that. We had fellowship. We were created. It says he came down and he walked in the cool of the day in the garden and it was awesome and we blew it. We forsook this communion and we violated our original purpose, which leads us to the third and the most powerful truth of all. Jesus died and rose again to restore our purpose. Amen. He died. That's why he came. He, the perfect sinless son of God, the sacrifice that came and paid our sin debt. Believing this is the key to knowing biblical freedom. It is the key to joy and passion. Biblical freedom is not that we do or be whatever we want. Don't believe that lie. It is, it is the ability for us to do what we want in accordance to what we should, based on who we are in him, in our identity. This is, so, this is why the loving creator created us in the first place. When we don't understand this, our identity, our focus becomes so, fo so fuzzy. We don't understand why we were created by a loving creator. Think about this. We were in a perfect paradise, the original Garden of Eden. Can you picture it? Are you good at doing a little, main, little mind painting? We were in this perfect paradise. It was perfect. The climate was never too warm. It was never too cold. There were no mosquitoes yet. We had no aches and pains and heartache. There was no weak Wi-Fi signal. No Netflix buffering. None of that. No satellite signal loss with the clouds right at the last minute of the... Are you kidding me? Did the shot go in or not? I still don't know who won last night. Don't tell me. Don't tell me. Think about this. The perfect garden. Everyone living together in peace, even dogs and cats living together. We had unlimited free Krispy Kremes. The hot now sign was always on. The sounds of Striper, Skillet, and Lauren Daigle filled the air. <laughs> oh, not really, but you understand where I'm going. I want you to see it was awesome. It was perfect. We had peace, and we lived together in harmony. We had dominion over everything, guys. Everything was at our disposal. He said, take, be dominion, be master. We even got to name the animals. Oh, there's just one thing. The tree of knowledge of good and evil. I forbid you to eat that. One restriction. I wonder what that tree's for. <laughs> right? And I know there's somebody in here, because I've said it. Well, why would God put the tree there in the first place? I've asked that. You know what? I don't know, because it's his world. It's his rules. And when you're God, you can decide. Okay? Go make your own planet. You can decide what you want. But he's our God. He's our creator. And he loves us. And I promise you this. I know this much. He only has your best at heart. And we blew it. And we've been running around trying. Guess what happened? Oh, he intercedes and he comes back and he makes something incredible out of what is looking like chaos. See, the serpent comes up to Eve and says, hey, how about that tree over there in the middle? That tree over there looks really good. No, no. Are you sure? Have you tasted that tree? Because look, he's like, nope, can't do it. And the serpent says, are you sure? Really? Because I hear it's gluten-free. I hear it's totally organic. It's keto-friendly. Why don't you try 
that fruit over there. Besides, did God really say you can't eat of that? Y'all, do you understand how wickedly genius this question is? I don't know if you grab, this is, this is incredible what he comes up. Just enough truth mixed with a lie. It is incre- and right here is the very first recorded question in history. Did God really say you shouldn't eat of every tree in the garden? It was so clever. Don't miss this. This seemingly innocent question appealed to our desire to rule ourselves. There it is. It appealed to our desire for self-rule, just enough to cause us to doubt God, to doubt his word and maybe doubt his heart. Yeah, why is God not allowing us to eat of that? Because it does look good. How wickedly genius. In fact, my research this week, I found a very rare, forgotten actual photo of that moment. Ryan's got it for us. We're going to put that up. There it is right there. Because I know the Lego Movie 2 came out in a couple weeks ago, whatever, and all the younglings love this. Okay, I worked hard for this so you could see what happened. Has God really said this? This simple seed of doubt took root in our hearts. And from that time on, we have struggled to know our boundaries. And I guarantee you, people in this room have asked, well, has God really said we can't do this? Or maybe, has God really said we should do that? Do I really have to love my enemies? Do I really have to pray for Because that guy is so on my nerves. Do I really have to do this? Or do I really not? Can I, you know, and, we, and we think it's restrictive. And we say, has God really said? As a student of the word, you know Satan enters this scene three chapters into the Bible. And the last time we see him is three chapters from the end. And the damage that question has caused is on every single page in between. That's how profound not knowing our boundaries are. By appealing to our pride and our desire to be in charge, to be self-ruled, the damage is everywhere. Now notice something very revealing about how the enemy works. Notice this, because I miss this. Notice he did not try to force Adam or Eve to eat this. He didn't come up and go, Jesus, you, you, <laughs> you will eat it. And he didn't, no headlocks, no suplex, none of that. He comes up and very innocently he says, hey, Innocent question. Did God really say? He appealed to basic logic. What is wrong with this? It's just a single piece of fruit. God knows if you eat it, you'll be like God yourself. Your eyes will be open. You'll know good and evil. What could possibly be bad about that? You want to know something kind of creepy? This is, this is, this is insidious. That's the last we see of our enemy for a long time. He shows up and he asks a very simple, innocent question. And then he leaves. And we took it from there. Just like that. That's all he did, and that's all he had to do. Can you believe this? The seed of temptation had been planted. The boundaries of God that he established have now been questioned. Did God really say that? Hmm. Fascinating. He walked off, and here's Adam and Eve. Well, you know, maybe there is something to that. What is wrong with being like God? What is it? I'm going to pull this over my mind, and I think, yeah. Sounds like a good idea to me. Off we go. You see how slippery and how simple that is? That's why I don't have any judgment for these guys. Because I know I would probably do the same thing. Well, that does sound pretty good. That tree looks awesome. I think that it's so strange that this whole scenario began with a simple question designed to cast a little bit of doubt in God's boundaries. It is still just as deadly today. When we don't recognize the danger back then, how in the world are we going to recognize the danger today? Think about this. People are still shading the truth today. Look what happens next in verse 7. It says, suddenly Adam and Eve knew they were naked. See, before that point, they didn't know, but they were naked. It's not like their clothes disappeared when they ate the fruit. It was just like, what happened? They were naked before. Suddenly their eyes were open and they were shocked. Think about this. It's almost as if God had been so much the center of their devotion and their life and their attention, they hadn't even realized it or cared. Oh, church, that's a, that's, a, that's a huge statement. They hadn't even cared. But guess what? When sin in the picture, they're all too focused on themselves and immediately went, cover up. <laughs> Let's go get some fig leaves. Let's go hide in shame. And God caught up to them, and we see the very first passing of the buck. Oh, this is so good. In fact, I think, Ryan, do we have another picture of that? We have the actual photo? There it is. Absolutely. There it is. Look what Adam does. The first thing out of his mouth. 
She did it. She gave me the fruit to eat. And if that's not bad enough, he even tries to blame God too. She did it. The woman, you gave me. You did this. You two are bad. You did this. It's not me. That's on you. That's on you. And guess what Eve does? Eve completes the triangle and says, mm, devil made me do it. <laughs> Bing, bong, boom, you're fired. Just three things just like that. Think about what happened. This is the ultimate passing of the buck because someone else is always to blame for our problems. Because we're always a victim. It's not my fault. The devil made me do it. I didn't. She made me do it. You did. Bing, boom. Will we take responsibility for our actions? That's not a popular thing today. Not at all. Think about what's just happened here. Someone else is always to blame for our wrong decisions, our failure, our sins. Oh, wait, we can't say that word because that implies personal accountability. So what do we do? We redefine the word. We say, uh, <clears throat> I have not sinned. I have had some shortcomings, <laughs> some foibles. <laughs> It sounds much more delightful. No, it's sin. And we had our own preference. And God said, do this. And we said, you don't know what you're talking about. I think I know better. I'll take it from here, sir. And we go and we live our life apart from God. And then we blame God. We have the audacity to blame God for the problems we have made. Guess who loves that? The devil. He's got to be just snickering. <laughs> He's blaming all this on him. That's awesome. And when it's my fingerprints all over this. This is so amazing. So God shows up and he says, what have you done? What have you done? And he knew those little fig leaves and the shame that they were hiding would never, never suffice. Those would never cover their shame. Guess what he does next? God takes an innocent animal and he kills it. And he takes their skins and their fur and he makes clothes for his children, for Adam and Eve. You want to hear something astounding? When that innocent animal took its last breath, it was the first to experience the deadly toll that sin would take. It's the first one. That innocent animal had nothing to do with what happened. Yet God knew they needed covering. And he gave them handcrafted fur skins. This animal's innocent death was just a foreshadowing of the real Lamb of God who would also die to cover our sin and our nakedness and our shame. What kind of love is this? And it all began with a simple question. Has God really said? Has God really said? Y'all, are we still being deceived by the serpent? Do we still fall for these blurring of the lines? Do we still fall for the, the shading of the truth? A little compromise here, a little compromise there. It's no big deal. Let's just get along. Absolutely. I, you know me. I'm the happy, clappy pastor. I want us to love each other. But not at the expense that we tear up God's word and we don't stand for truth. We stand for nothing. If we don't believe the foundations of our faith, why in the world would anyone else? When we don't stand on his boundaries, these things, I mean, a little compromise, a little shading here, just a little bit of blurring the lines and, and just let's acquiesce and give a little bit more of God's truth away. Let's redefine things so that we just keep peace. Appearances can be deceiving. In 1884, something huge happened. We didn't know about it till recently. But there was a young boy who died. And his parents were torn up, and rightfully so. And they were grieving. And they wanted so desperately to establish a memorial to him, something that would honor him in the memory of their beloved son who was gone way too soon, something to keep his memory alive. So with that in mind, they made an appointment to go meet with this guy right here, Dr. Elliot, a joyful-looking man who was the president of Harvard University. 150 years ago. We're here talking 1884. So Dr. Elliot heard they wanted to meet with him. He receives this kind, humble couple into his office, barely has time for him, and very hastily asks, what can I do for you? Well, they began to share their heart and express their desire to fund a memorial for their son. And Dr. Elliot impatiently interrupted and said, perhaps you have in mind a, a small scholarship or something we could do. We'll just do that. Well, no. The mother went on to say, 
That, that's not what we actually were thinking something far more substantial than that, perhaps an entire building or, or something like that. Again, in a patronizing tone, Dr. Elliot dismissed them, brushed aside their idea, said it's too expensive for this pitiful, grieving couple. So the meeting ended, and they left. They left his office, and we find out a year later, Dr. Elliot, I don't know if he gets a letter or some kind of early phone call, or he's playing on his Commodore 64, but somehow he learns that in just one year, this humble, unassuming, ordinary appearing couple had gone elsewhere. And they took their memorial across the street, way across the street, and established a massive $26 million memorial named after their son, Leland Stanford Jr., known today as Stanford University. All because appearances were deceiving. He didn't get it. Imagine how Dr. Elliot is kicking himself. See, appearances were deceiving. The enemy loves to disguise himself so he can sneak up, work unseen, blurring the lines in your marriage, blurring the lines in your finances or in your relationships at work. If he can come and he can just very quietly redefine truth for you, then he has erased your boundaries. Do you allow that? Do I? Think about this. He loves to come in and erase boundaries that God has put in place for our good. So church, here's my question and my challenge. Can we tell when the enemy is at work? Can we honestly tell when he is very quietly getting out his eraser and erasing boundaries? You see why it's so important that we tell the kids these boundaries are for your good. It's not a fence to hem you in. It's a guardrail so that you don't plunge off the cliff. But the enemy wants to chip away at the foundation, redefining Scripture to mean something totally different than what it says. Do we even know his word well enough to detect a lie when we see it? When we look at Genesis, and I see God's created this perfect paradise, and Satan shows up, and he just in a matter of seconds begins to erase boundaries with one seed of doubt. And we fell for it. And we've been paying the price ever since, trying to get back home, back into God's presence every day since. In the Bible, this whole book is a record of this heartbreaking journey. But it ends with awesome news. Satan entered the scene, as we've seen, three chapters into the Bible. And the last time we encounter him is three chapters from the end. And his end is brutal. And it's coming, and it's sure. It's perfect bookends. And God's love letter to us, this story that begins in Genesis with paradise lost, oh, oh. praise God, it ends in Revelation with paradise regained for those who know the Savior and accept these boundaries. Is that you? I hope so. If not, it can be. Will you pray with me? Let's bow together. God, I thank you that you've given us the privilege to come home. Forgive us, Lord. For those who may be here today or even watching online or driving in their car and just streaming this, Lord, I pray that if they don't know you and they're still outside the garden, that you would knock on their heart. Lord, soften our hearts, just as you soften mine and so many others, and allow you to come in and forgive our sin and our shame and cover us with the sweet, perfect sacrifice that you paid for us, Jesus. Thank you for the cross. Thank you that you endured shame and brutality and pain that was not yours. You did it for us. That is love, and we thank you for that. Thank you for the gospel, the good news, that we're not left to just flounder in our sin, but any who call on the name of the Lord will be saved. So, God, we call on your name. We repent of our sin. We don't just pray some cheap, easy prayer looking for fire insurance, Lord. We declare you our Lord. We believe you are who you say you are. We believe your word is true. And we know that we have sinned. So God, would you forgive us? Holy Spirit, invade our life. Seal us for the day of redemption. You are so good. Thank you for your word. Thank you for the life-changing power it gives us. In Jesus' name, amen.